Okay. So we're recording this. Everybody turn your cameras on where uh, Dr. Kuhn can see you. If I slip and call him Robert, just understand that uh, 54 years ago, I was 22 years old. So now you know how old I am. Robert's a couple years older than I am. So 54 years ago, uh, we both walked into a classroom at a small liberal arts college in California. I was teach. I was um, getting my master's at Pepperdine. You probably heard of Pepperdine. Robert already had his PhD from UCLA, I believe, uh, when I met him. And the uh, person in charge of academic, I guess you'd be like a provost, uh, more than a dean, uh, asked me if I would teach Hebrew part-time, uh, you know, as I was working on my master's. So I said, sure. And he said, well, there's a gentleman you've never met, uh, Robert Kuhn. His field is uh, science of the brain, but we're thinking uh, he, he's also gone to yeshiva and he studied Hebrew. Maybe you two would like to team up together. I thought, huh, Robert Kuhn, I've never heard of him. He's not in my field. He's more like a biologist or a brain scientist. But I mean, why not? So we met, and uh, guess what, Robert? I got two things to show you. This is the textbook. I actually have the textbook. Wow. Wow, and inside, I remember that. you guys probably won't be able to see it, but it says nineteen. It says uh, uh, nineteen sixty-eight. It, the fall of 68. So it, it's Weingren's Hebrew grammar. Yeah, I and I found the grade book for our class. That's amazing. <laughs> so I keep things. Send me, here, send me, a, send me a, a, a photo of the. Yeah, I uh, will. Now, here are the grades for this semester that you and I turned in. And I'm going to read you the names of the class. I know this won't mean anything to you guys, but Kuhn is actually going to remember some of these students. Just like I'm going to remember you like 54 years from now, right? When I'm like, I'll be, God, I'll be way over the age of Moses. David Albert, wow. Gary Alexander. See, we wow. still know these people. I, I know. Uh, you, you saw him interview Albert. Remember, some of you commented on it. That guy, David Albert, that he interviewed, he was in our Hebrew class. Uh, Neil Colton, I remember Neil very well. Oh, yeah. Reynold Crandall, he, uh, uh, William Denkenbrink, Lester Gravy, the famous wow. Hebrew Bible scholar. So he took baby Hebrew from us, literally yeah. learning the alphabet from us. And then Michael Heiss, remember Michael, the Jewish guy, yeah. Michael Heiss, yeah. So that was our class. I'm not going to tell you the grades, but I'll, I'll send them to you, Robert, to refresh. Yeah, send them. Oh, I'd love to see that. Every, every, I know everybody in that class. That Isn't that amazing? Was... Yeah, how our memory yeah. works. So I was 22 uh, at the age of a lot of you. How many of you are 22? I bet a bunch of you are. Anybody 22? Kelly, Katie, you know, you could teach a class. I mean, some of you have already taught uh, different kinds of classes. So here's what we want to do, uh, Dr. Kuhn. Uh, they have watched six videos. I told you the ones. The way they break down basically is consciousness, death, and the cosmos. Really big. But on the cosmos, more the idea of is the cosmos theologically ambiguous? Do we maybe learn something from the cosmos? Like, wow, there's a great designer, or maybe there's an intelligence higher than ours by looking at the cosmos. Now, these are all just huge topics. And I know from your index that I referred them to uh, that you created of all of the 19 years of programs that there are like 10, 15, 20, 50 shows on each one of these. And so, you know, so here's what I, I want to do. We're going to do a kind of a one minute thing first before we get to the deep stuff, because I, I picked uh, questions that the students uh, asked of you. And these you're supposed to just take a minute on. So these aren't like the big ones, like is the universe theologically ambiguous? One minute, Robert, come on. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there are things like this. How would you, this is from Abdullah. Where's Abdullah? Raise your hand, Abdullah, wave. He's usually here. He should be here. 
maybe he's off on the other screen. Let me see. I'm doing, there he is. Okay, you see him up in the corner. How would you explain death to a child? One minute. Let's make the child uh, five years old. And, and you have children. So how do you explain death? Not like your religion, but just what would be a good way to talk about death? That is well, a great, uh, great question. I, it is a great question. And uh, I'm not sure if a five-year-old is appropriate for that type of, uh, of discussion. It, it would come up naturally when somebody that that five-year-old died, uh, often a grandparent, say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so it, it, um, it, I, I think how, how, it would, how a family would literally do that would be based on their own religious uh, orientation. I, I, th I think that's right. That, that's, uh, that's not the kind of closest to truth question we would ask because it's more of a sociological, psychological uh, family question. And so the reality of what it may be is not terribly relevant. I'm sure if the family had a belief in um, any religion. Sure. Because right. one of the um, characteristics of virtually every religion is some kind of afterlife existence. Mm -hmm. Even religions that don't believe in God, like uh, aspects of Buddhism or some sects of, of uh, Hinduism, uh, they still believe in some kind of uh, non-physical reality that you would uh, merge into. Right. Um, and, what about you, though? I think Abdullah actually wants, he's listened to you talk, and he's seen you at the end say, well, there it is, and I'm still searching. So yeah. you got to go back in time. You're, you, somebody yeah. in your family died, and you're talking to one of your three children. What would you say now, you know, hypothetically? Because you're now, you, I think he wants to know because you studied all what would you say the non not necessarily religion but what would you say i think that's what yeah. he wants to know yeah i i would say and, and it would begin reflecting my own point of view that uh the we won't see grandma anymore yeah. because uh there is a, a a cycle of life and um in order for new life to come um, like you and your little friends, um, there needs to be a, a, a yeah. turnover. There's a natural turnover in the physical way of, uh, uh, of existence. We see that with trees. We see that with animals. We see that oftentimes, by the way, it's not the, the first encounter with death that a child would have would be with a, a, a pet. Exactly. Actually, a Very pet, often. A pet dog or a pet cat and the dog is no longer there so that slightly changes the orientation so i would i would speak yeah. about the way of the way of the 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 universe is designed in a right. in a manner to give new life the opportunity um and so that's i, that's I think good. that's good a, nat a natural way to do it i, I told i told the students you know that told them about my son david dying whom you knew when he yeah, was in the Navy, and uh, I, I said, when people say sorry for your loss, you know, it sounds kind of like tried and everybody repeats the same thing, but you know what? It's absolutely the best phrase, because it's loss. You know, it's basically like gone. And yeah. so uh, I think it's a, a, a good way to say it. Okay, second question. Uh, you got to make this fast because we got the big ones later, but this is kind of a big one. Um, do you have you ever interviewed someone? You got to think back the thousands of interviews you've done where you were really significantly changed by this person after the interview, you yourself. Yeah. It, like uh, who had like that kind of impact on you knowing all the questions and approaches uh, you went away thinking, wow, that was that was enlightening. I love the when uh, I learned something new, when uh, I didn't something I didn't know before. And 
uh, it doesn't have to be something I agree with. It can be just a radically or, or a different way of thinking about the same kind of, of, uh, of question. Um, the, the one experience that I've had, and I've, I've talked about this and she's, uh, and, and she and I now laugh about it, uh, is with a very, probably the world's most uh, famous female theologian. She's one of the world's most famous theologians, uh, you know, ir irrespective of gender, but she happens to be female. She recently retired as the uh, Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University in the UK. And she's a, uh, a, a um, Church of England priest at the same time. And um, we've become very good friends. What is uh, her name? What is her name? Sarah Copley. You can look her up. Okay, they, they watched her when they did the resurrection shows. You guys oh, remember sure. that? Like we're doing these six, but remember when we did the resurrection, Sarah? You can go back and look. It's on. Yeah, yeah, she, we, yeah we, like, we like her. We liked her. Yeah, she's one of the uh, top thinkers in the world. Uh, but in our very first uh, meeting, um, a first interview, very first time. So we weren't friends. I didn't know her. Um, I was uh, kind of pushing her hard on her belief system. And uh, she did something that no one else has ever done to me. And she kind of reversed it and said, you know, what are the things in your life that are troubling? So she started asking me <laughs> questions and did it in a way that was uh, psychologically actually very powerful. And I found myself kind of being drawn in to her aura of thinking. And when I found myself doing that, what I did was instead of resisting it, which would have been easy to do the opposite, to allow myself or to encourage myself to, to, to uh, get into her way of thinking. I wanted to experiment. Um, and it was, it was, it, 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 I won't say it had a permanent transformation, but I did feel within the moment a being drawn in to her, to her way of thinking. It, it would not, you know, on its own convince me that there's, there's a God or that the Christian religion was right, or that the Church of England had an inside track to reality, um, ultimately. But it did show the psychological uh, power uh, of, um, of, of, of deep ideas about religious teachings. And, it, um, uh, and, and that, that, that doesn't trivialize religion because if you believe in God, then God made the human brain and mind to be susceptible sure, to those sure. kinds of things. So you, know, you right. can interpret it, interpret it both ways is not a problem. Um, but I did see now the, the, the psychological involved uh, uh, participation in it, you know, doesn't in any way uh, relate to any specific theological expression, because you could have that in, in any, any religion. But, but that was, I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, as, as uh, James said, it was, uh, you know, I've interviewed, uh, it's, uh, you know, for closer to truth, I'd say over 500 people. And these are interviews that are not just, you know, 10, 15 minutes, they're each right. uh, three, right. three hours right. or so. Um, and, th and that was the only time that I've, I've had that, yeah. that experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that actually was from Chandler Palmer. Chandler, are you here? I think you saw him, yep, somewhere. Hey, Chandler. Uh, a lot of people ask the same questions. So if I mention your name it, and you say, well, I asked that. Yeah, I just, you know, I grouped them together. Okay, Josh Kugler wants to know, do you think there might be life on other planets, but not like God might have made life, but like he's really asking that could life be created spontaneously? Like given the right conditions, could you have some primitive DNA and primitive cell replication and so that we could expect uh, in a natural process to find what we call life. Ours is carbon-based, I guess, but I know that's a big one, but uh, yeah, it, he's it, just looking. 
Yeah, try to do it quickly if you can, just to sort of sense where you are on that question. Yeah, sure. Uh, and this is a very profound question in, uh, in it's what's now called astrobiology. And the general, uh, general assumption among the vast majority of scientists is the answer is just yes, that given the right conditions, life would, 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 would emerge. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why that's the, the case. Um, one thing I do with this is the tension between those who believe in God and those who don't believe in God. And what I do, and this will take just a, a, a short period of time, it's a really important way to think about the question, um, is that it, whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, and you believe that there is life in the universe or not life in the universe other than Earth, uh, you can justify it. So it's like a two by two matrix. So either you believe in God or you don't, and there is life in the universe other than Earth and teeming with life, as most people most scientists would think just on the astronomical numbers, or there isn't. And so if you believe in God and there isn't life in, universe, in the universe, then you say, see, God made life just specially for Earth. If there is a God and there is life teeming in the universe, you say, see, God made a universe enormously hospitable to life, so it appears everywhere. If you don't believe in God, and you and we're a uh, unique in, in, in the universe. You say, see, the universe is so anti-life that we're the only place that exists, so God can't exist. And if the if the world is teeming with life, and and God doesn't exist in your belief, then you say that um, that uh, see, the universe is teeming with life, so human life is not so special. And so, you know, yeah, is irrelevant. That's really, yeah, so either option, yeah, all the options. Yeah, so the point is, whatever your belief system is, mm -hmm. you will interpret this big question of life in the universe or no life in the universe other than Earth in a way that is consistent with your belief. And to me, that's a very deep way of understanding how people look at all reality. Yeah, that's very insightful. You interpret it in, in your own your own matter. This came out of one interview that I, that I did early on. And in that interview, the person was a really famous astrobiologist uh, and he did not believe in God. And he came up with those two scenarios that if the universe is full of life, that then you, we're not special. You know, and then I realized you could do it the other way as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you for that. that. Yeah. I had a biologist and you tell me if this is, this is my question, but a biologist told me once who was working with um, frozen embryos and uh, he, he talked about how a cell, a human cell, can be brought down to a certain temperature and all metabolic activity ceases, but it's not dead. But nothing's happening. There's no respiration. There's no exchange of energy. It's simply in stasis. And as long as the tissue isn't destroyed, it's like you preserve this structure. And what he was telling me is everybody thinks that there's this uh, concrete quality called life and then it like comes in mysteriously. Like what would make that cell quote alive or is it dead? Well, it's dead in the sense that it's not doing anything but it's not dead in the sense that it's deteriorating. So then he said, as it's brought up to you know, normal temperature where it can begin to work, begin to thrive again, it takes up its normal, you know, metabolic functions without any outside. And I found that very insightful because it's not that I necessarily believe life was something outside. You know, I didn't necessarily believe that. But I never really thought of it in that exact way. It, is he accurate about that? Like, do all of you follow me here? Like you could have a dead... I, I, a dead frozen cell, but then it's not dead because it's still alive. People I, I, freeze their bodies for that reason, right? The crypto. I'm now, yeah. now going to give you a, a personal example of that, which uh, no matter how much I have studied biology and doctorates and everything, I'm still mystified by. Wow. Um, and that is um, uh, my daughter 
uh, very personal, and and she's actually here in the house, just about ready to leave. Well, they visit. Okay. Well, um, so if there's any noise in the background, it's because there's a two-year-old kid here who's wow. running around totally healthy, and he was uh, conceived uh, when my daughter had um, frozen her eggs when she was about 33. Uh, didn't get married till very late in life. Her husband's uh, younger than her. He's French. They just they're spending their time. They spend their time both in, in France and here. And um, her ten uh, year old frozen egg from when she was thirty. Uh, she just she, she, she carried it when she was forty nine, and gave oh. normal birth at forty nine with a ten year old frozen egg artificially inseminated. Uh, mm -hmm. That was flown from Los New York, where oh, she had God. done, to Los Angeles. Wow. A ten-year-old frozen egg, flown from New York, where it had been kept for ten years, to Los Angeles, where it was artificially inseminated by her husband, inserted in her, and she carried it to term. That is just with, with uh, you know twenty genetic tests along the line because the odds were very high that it would be abnormal um and it passed every test and the kid is two years old running around the house uh, you know uh, pointing I mean, out you certainly answered that question about a frozen cell for us uh, wow that is so amazing to contemplate um let's see there's a few more. Let me pick another fast one, and then I want to go to these. I want to go to consciousness, death, and cosmos more specifically. Um, and I explain to them why you call it closer to truth. So Jack Howard asks, you know, does they understand why it's closer and why it's not the truth? I, I told them that when we started. Yeah, so that, that, that's really critical. It's very Everybody. important. Yeah, and. So after, here's his question, after 20 years of seeking answers closer to truth, accepting your understanding of that, what is one issue you would most like to answer definitively? You know, maybe get the truth. Like, is there a single issue? I mean, there's so many, and they overlap, but what? Right, if, if I had to uh, pick one, um, I, I would ask for uh, the, question, the, the way I would phrase it would not be, you know, is there a God or not, which other people might pick, but a little more fundamental than that. Is there any, is, is there anything that is absolutely necessary for existence that it would be impossible for that thing not to exist? Now, most people would define God in, in that way, but it doesn't have to be God. It could be something else. It could be consciousness. It could be quantum physics. It could be all other things we can't imagine. So that's the way I would phrase the, the, the question. Is there anything in fundamental existence that does not, that, that of, its, of itself has necessary existence, it, that it must exist. Uh, I just did, and, and some people might be interested, a, um, a, uh, a video, which I did myself, as opposed to interviewing people, called Asking Ultimate Questions. And what I did was I posed, I came up with 53 ultimate questions. I saw that. I would ask. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, that, that's really some of the, the final ultimate questions when you get down to it. So you can ask these ultimate questions, ultimate being the most fundamental questions in various fields, like right. consciousness or universe or different things. But when you get to the most fundamental, there's that question, you know, is there, is there anything that has necessary existence? And the alternative to that is what's called brute fact that, there is things that exist, like the physical universe, but we can't say there's no reason why it exists. It just does exist, which is obvious, and you can't go beyond that. And that's called brute fact. Yeah. Others would yeah. say there's a, a, a necessary reason it exists, and most people would put God into that category. Some people would put kind of mathematical structure 
yeah. that category. So mathematical structure has to exist. One and one always has to be two. And somehow yeah. that can have we can't have square circles. We can't have an object so big that an ultimate force couldn't pick it up by definition and so forth. Yeah. Right. So those are those are issues of logic and mathematics. Yeah. That they has, do seem to be embedded in at least the way we see reality. Okay, Faith Doughty had a really interesting question. We noticed as a class that this is on consciousness and life after death whether you're talking to um, Deepak or any of these people, that you're desperate to hang, hang on to your personal identity. <laughs> you know, you do this a lot, you know, and you go, yeah, no, I don't want that. <laughs> so here's what uh, Faith asks. Uh, if the personal identity is what Kuhn is desperate to hang on to, even after death, could a soul, I think she means an individual soul, still have all the characteristics of your many personal identities while also operating with a collective consciousness, thinking like reincarnation, many lives. Why would these two be mutually exclusive? Are souls outside of consciousness? I'm not sure what she means by that, but face here. I understand the question. It's a very, it's yeah, a very good question. It's a good question, yeah. Uh, uh, it's mutually exclusive if the cosmic consciousness is your primary way of thinking i mean we can blend the two together but this was put wonderfully uh, closer to truth by the way as you might have looked at it has had a very strong uh, uh christian philosophy orientation judeo-christian some mm -hmm. islamic uh, just because the two reasons one is the geography of closer to truth that you know i've done it mostly in the uk and u.s and also uh, because the, frankly, the most sophisticated philosophy in general has come from Christian philosophy from the Middle Ages onward. However, as, as culture has gotten more broad, we've realized and we've gotten criticized because we have a very large following now in India that people really love this stuff, but they like their tradition. So we've now uh, generated a global philosophy of religion as one of our prime objectives. We just published in the last year, 25 interviews with leading um, um, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, Islamists, yeah. and also, also diverse religions, Baha'i, Jainism, Sikhism, um, um, uh, 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 Zoroastrianism, Shintoism from Japan, and each one has a different facet. And we're going to be continuing that as a major theme. But one of the, our, our Hindu experts, he's really very sophisticated, he's a Hindu monk, in India, but he has a PhD in Western philosophy from Berkeley. So very sophisticated wow. guy, very sophisticated guy. And he said, and he, he has a title of an article that just wonderfully expresses this question. And he says, what's the difference between uh, eating sugar and being sugar <laughs> as, as the way to, uh, personalize this question of life after death and what it means. He says, which would you rather be after death to eat sugar all the time or to be sugar all the time? Mm -hmm. And he uses that as a springboard to discuss in depth uh, this, uh, this question. Are those already available or some of these? Uh, the first 25, which are online, uh, are available. So it's on YouTube or the Closer to Truth channel. Uh, it's a global philosophy of religion. Um, in okay. So that actually answers Dave Brown's question, which I thought was excellent. Uh, the videos you watch cover experts from mainstream well-known religions, mainly Abrahamic. Have you ever interviewed those from lesser known groups? And he even mentions Zoroastrianism, Wicca, uh, different kinds of, but you sort of answered yeah. it. And then there's By a way, I, Yeah, go ahead. I, I should also add, we have made a, a specific focus to uh, um, recruit African religions. So in our first uh, version of it, we have a leading Af African philosopher. Our second version, we're going to be filming on location in Birmingham, England in June. And uh, we have a, a lineup of we have two African philosophers and philosophers from each of the other traditions, which will be in Closer to Truth's normal style. These will be out uh, 
you know, by the end of the year or next year, we have a long uh, lead time uh, because of the high production values. Uh, so it, it's, it's really fascinating to see the, the similarities and differences uh, among all the religions. And this is just, you know, we're just starting this process, but the first are available, including African religions, which is very important to, uh, to, to include. Okay, so David uh, Brown, that I don't know if David's here, thinking might be, but that would answer your question, I think. So you can really trove around on YouTube or Closer to Truth Thursday, saying hi to you. So now I want to switch to, we're going to do consciousness, death, and is the cosmos uh, theologically ambiguous? And we only have a few minutes, but uh, I want to start with the idea of humor and jokes. We're thinking of, you know, John Searle's Chinese box and so forth, and the idea of brain of uh, machines being conscious and particularly self-conscious. So do you think a computer, as infinite as you want to make it, could get this joke? I'm going to give you the joke. I've got a couple here. <laughs> okay. Why was the tomato red? This is like a little kid joke. Like a five-year-old would love this, right, Katie? Why was the tomato red? Because he saw the salad dressing. <laughs> okay, so as you can so, see right away, it is funny, but it's extremely complex because red is now meaning embarrassed. Dressing is meaning nakedness. So no matter what kind of program you wrote, I know you'd have to have social things included, but could the computer ever get what that is even saying? And better than that, would it enjoy the humor? Would it go <laughs> like you did? You kind of went, <laughs> that's cute. Because uh, I, I have my doubts about that, but I think you think computers eventually could become conscious or self-conscious. There's no I don't know if you think that. I, I think before you... First of all, I differentiate between conscious and self-conscious. Yes. Two separate yes. kinds of things. Um, so it's a very probative question because it, it, it deter determines what you mean by get the joke. Um, and get the joke, uh, there's no doubt that a computer program, even today, could be programmed to understand that it is a joke. Uh, it's, it's probably pretty close today, but... 100% sure it could get the joke, but it depends what you mean by get the joke. And Searle's Chinese room is the, is the way to understand that because the Chinese room, you put in a character, it has an algorithm internally that tells you what it means. Uh, but there's no internal sense in that, in that uh, Chinese room of, of understanding meanings at all. It's just a one-to-one -one relationship. So a program, a computer can be programmed to understand the joke and explain the joke. So how do you know the, the computer program uh, understands the joke? It would explain exactly the way James did just now. So there are two, two versions of red. I compared this with one. I saw the obvious one didn't make sense, but the, the two separate meanings of red and dressing makes sense and it's, it's kind of cute. Absolutely a, a computer program uh, can, can do that. Can that. But yeah. that is, doesn't mean that the computer program in any way is conscious. And conscious means there's an internal movie, an internal awareness that we all have um, that, that the computer would have. And that's a totally radically different question. And okay. the second question is, would there be a self-conscious of it, uh, which, is, which is you knowing you're conscious and having a, a sense of my own consciousness in the process. And um, personally, I, I do not think that is possible. In a in a computer, but that's that's a most most well all physicalists people who don't believe in anything other than the physical world majority of scientists not totally not all scientists but majority would say that it, you know, ultimately computers okay. can but yeah. mm -hmm. but I, I I would not let me go to our favorite uh, Dave Chalmers we all love Dave the best in these videos. And especially how you traced his views. And I even watched his new thing you did with him on virtual reality, which I recommend. 
But uh, let me just review with you guys. Remember Dave, first he's the hippie with the shirt and, <laughs> and his hair changes and we were laughing at his different. But what we liked about him is, uh, here's what we wrote down. Chalmers characterizes his view as naturalistic dualism. Naturalistic because he thinks mental states supervene naturally on physical systems such as brains. Dualist because he believes mental states are ontologically distinct from and not reducible to physical systems. Would that be close to what you're saying in his language that it's like he wouldn't want to say he's just a dualist per se, but he doesn't think. No, I, I would say it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, the supervening part uh, is a physicalist kind of argument. So I'm not sure he would take the first part. Uh, he would take the second part. Uh, absolutely, that mental states are not reducible to brain states. That, that kind of contradicts the first part. The supervening means it is somehow related to it and absolutely tied to it. So I don't think he would have the first. He would have the second, where brain states are, where mental states are not reducible to brain states. But then what his, his physicalist view would say is that he's not a dualist in the sense that he believes there's a non-physical soul or spirit or something in a right. non-physical world. He doesn't believe that. What he does believe is there's something about the physical world that we don't know yet that there's some mental component of the physical world. And this is uh, called various kinds of panpsychism. Yeah. Uh, that's not pantheism. Pantheism means the whole world was God sure. or something. Mm -hmm. But it's panpsychism where every element in the physical world has like it has four physical uh, main properties, you know, gravity, electromagnetism, and the nuclear strong force and the nuclear weak force. These are the be four. A fifth force. Yeah, this would be a real thing. thing. Yeah, force. Mm -hmm. We don't. Yeah, it's just a fifth kind of characteristic that all physical things would have. So consciousness, in a sense, is baked in fundamentally to the structure of the physical world. We just can't access it. We don't know what it is. And then you have problems. Then you have what's called the combination problem. Why is it that if you have a certain number of these things, like in my chair, uh, we have, you know, trillions and trillions of those particles in that chair, each one has this little bit of consciousness, but the chair is not conscious. Yeah. So what is the difference? Uh, and that's a hard question for panpsychists to answer if you're staying entirely within the physical world. Is the term uh... Are the terms physical, material, natural, supernatural loaded terms, it sounds like, so that we set it up by even using those terms? Is it possible we could simply talk about what is? Don't call it material. Don't call it spiritual. Don't talk about physical meta. Just we know of four forces, and we have this other phenomena that we're having a class right now and talking it appears to be beyond what we could imagine computers could do exactly in this way, at least this exploratory way, like watch shows like Closer to Truth or Beyond as a guest. Uh, so is part of it just terminology? We've inherited this dualistic terminology from our uh, Western background or even the Eastern background. And I think mean, that's a <clears throat> legitimate case to make. Uh, but I, I don't think that's the total answer. I do think there's a, a very distinct answer to, to the question. Uh, some people believe in, 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 you know, the world is monistic. That's only one kind of thing. Uh, and then we just see it in different ways. Um, but how do, and, and so string theory in the physical world is, is an attempt to do that. Uh, but that doesn't embed consciousness in any way whatsoever. That's is completely irrelevant. So, so some people would believe that the world is monistic, means only one kind of thing, and that kind of thing is consciousness. There's a group of serious philosophers who, who espouse that today, <clears throat> that, every, that every, the real reality is consciousness and the physical world is, is a derivative of consciousness. So reality is monistic, there's only one kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I think both ways of thinking is good to 
compartmentalized with physicalism, materialism, non-physicalism, a spiritual, so, you know, to see the yeah. different, and then to do it monistically, to so both ways, should in, in order to explore the depth of the of the thinking. There is, you know, the one thing I can assure you is there's no universal solution that everybody agrees with. And some people even deny that consciousness is even a problem, so it shouldn't even be an issue. Yeah. And that's a distinct minority, but, um, it, you know, consciousness is, Definitely one, uh, uh, perhaps the singular, um, the singular probe of reality, mm. which uh, is uh, is is critical to understand the deep nature of reality. And, and you know, the, the, the I are... remember you you told me that you really admired Marvin Minsky, the late Marvin Minsky, and I encourage the students to look up those interviews. And but. I remember in his interviews, uh, maybe this was his position, he would talk about brains and computers and how they'll grow and develop. And he seemed to have no sense of mystery whatsoever. Like, no, it's, what's the problem? It's nothing. It's just, it's just gonna finally get complex and computers will be just like us. And yet he was so brilliant. I When I listened to him, I thought like, how can you, to me, that was as big a leap as someone who's a dualist. You know, he just thought, "What? I don't see what 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 you're even saying." You know, he seemed to think it was obvious that a machine would someday be self-conscious. Did you? And yet, you admired him greatly. I know that. Yeah, um, Mar Marvin was really one of my favorite people, and if people want to explore that, we did one show called a, a tribute to Marvin Minsky when he when he after he died. We took a uh, excerpts from all of the interviews you did we did a you know yeah. 30 minute program yeah. on that which was one of my favorite he, he has outrageous statements about <laughs> religion about society uh, yeah. and and they're you know I, I i think i disagree with everyone but i'm just captivated <laughs> by by his way of thinking and he knew i had different views but he was a great supporter of closer to truth um, he, yeah. uh, from the very first, uh, very first time we, we were uh, fledgling. So he was a, a great friend and a great supporter, uh, even though I ultimately disagree with almost everything he says, I love everything <laughs> he says. Uh, and, and, and James is right. He, he has a view, uh, that the, 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 the brain, is, the mind is not mysterious at all. It can be compartmentalized, his famous book called The Society of Minds, which meant there are different brain components that come together that give you the illusion that we have a unified conscious experience, but they can be teased apart uh, through trauma. And that's true. And so that's a powerful argument that you can have the most bizarre mental uh, uh, problems uh, in extreme cases. For example, you can uh, be totally normal, except you cannot name any vegetable. Uh, you can name any meat, you can name any object, but you can't name a vegetable uh, because there are parts of the mind that work in different ways. So you can show very clearly that that's the way that our sense of a unified consciousness is kind of a... a, a yeah, it's tied to the brain. In the local but it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a combination of things that we integrate uh, that, it, that, is, that comes from different components. So his arguments and, and others who make that uh, are, are not to be dismissed. I mean, they are, that's real data about how the brain and the mind works. So, you know, life is, is uh, these questions are, are real and there are legitimate um, uh, points on, on, on all sides. Okay, so I wanna, uh, we're gonna open it up to people in a minute, but I want to uh, switch from consciousness to and we'll come back to death. I want to come back to death, but is the universe theologically ambiguous? But I want to particularly go back to this uh, spontaneous generation of life kind of thing. There are uh, people that hold the so-called design idea, you know, that somehow we're designed. God or wouldn't have to be theism, but some, something, some mind beyond ours that has to plan something. And these people would say, there's no coding, like DNA coding, for example, 
with its string of you know four characters and the double helix and so forth that nature itself never creates any kind of coding of that type you could use almost anything i mean minsky said you could use popsicle sticks and make a brain you know he was just joking about it. it's not the carbon that is really it it's the can you preserve the information somehow so is what is your view of that uh I mean, it's the Robinson Crusoe question that I'm on the proverbial beach and I see the windswept sand and sticks on the beach and so forth. But then if I see a, a pattern of rocks in a star or I see the footprint in the sand, a human footprint, that would be the equivalent of design or coding, then I know that that was done by something that's akin to me, meaning conscious planning, uh, deliberation, awareness. So how do you get from the moon or Mars or a windswept planet or just a crater, you know, a place where maybe there is no life, but you've got these elements. How do you go from those elements and the forces that move them to any kind of coding, which would be information that's stored and retrieved and somehow made use of in creating everything from a flower to us. Do you, do you follow what I'm getting at? Um, sure. Um, th th there are complex molecules in uh, in comets and uh, in space uh, that are you know, very sophisticated molecules, even uh, peptides that are the that are the that are the uh, components of proteins. So. We know that those have been uh, synthesized uh, in the in in the natural world, um, but no code yet. Like they would be the building no blocks. Code, but but it you know. But when you have peptides and and you have you know thousands of molecules that are part of those peptides or even hundreds, um, you have the potential for that. Um, and so, you know, you have to make some kind of a leap from those peptides to something that encodes information. But, you know, but people can define information in different ways. You, you can have a peptide structure that because it, it's, uh, it's aligned in the right way, you, you can argue that there's a code in that because otherwise it would just be, you know, random hydrogen atoms, not just all, right. you know, kind of bashing around but somehow through gravity and through the synthesis within stars and then they explode as supernova and and, and synthesize uh, more complex molecules and then they combine through the various forces of electromagnetism and gravity over you know hundreds of millions and billions of years the slow force of gravity brings these together and they have alignment so you can you can make a story how it happens um, without without a, too much excessive wonder, but the fundamental question about is is the universe uh, theologically ambiguous? To me, is a very profound question. I, I'm not sure anybody has ever asked that other than closer to truth. And it came to me because uh, most of the scientists are uh, atheistic, but there's a you know fairly substantial subset of the scientists uh, who were some of the top scientists who believe very strongly in God. And so, you know, my argument is uh, not a very sophisticated one, if, but I see, you know, many scientists who believe in no God and atheistic and many scientists or a, perhaps a lesser number, but still a very healthy cohort of scientists who do believe in God. Uh, who have a very sophisticated understanding of physics and biology and everything else. And so that to me, at least from our perceptive point of view, indicates that maybe the answer is that the universe is, and each side argues the, the strength of their argument very strongly, like how is it possible? Uh, I, I've asked this to one of the leading, uh, at least public atheists, uh, Sean Carroll, uh, who's a very good friend, and, you know, and I, I would, I asked him the question, for example, is the universe theologically ambiguous? And he said, of course not. 
it's there is no God and it's obvious. And I said, how come, you know, and I mentioned three or four of our mutual friends who are very sophisticated scientists, as he is, uh, who believe in God. And he said, I can't imagine why. <laughs> so to me, um, you know, he laughed. He said, you know, I think they're wrong and I can't imagine why they have that view. So well, several, several that you interviewed in the show we watched went to personal experience and said, well, I just had this experience with God and I can't deny right. it. And the one gentleman I remember said, I don't remember his name, but he said, it's as real as me talking to you. You yeah. know, I don't doubt that experience and I don't doubt. And I think a lot of our students uh, are theists and you could say, well, they were raised that way or the religious families or whatever. But as, as we've talked about the numinous and the transcendent and, you know, personal experiences of art, music, so forth, it seems like uh, people also rely just as much on they believe in God because they sense, they feel like they sense God, whereas someone else like your atheist friend would go, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't feel that at all. You know, I never have. Nothing is you know, I think it's all explainable and so forth. So, yeah, we're we're focusing on uh, 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 art and music as vehicles yeah. for uh, this transcendent feeling. Uh, the next series of programs we're also doing in England, separately from Global Philosophy of Religion, is art seeking understanding. A second season of that, where we're going to focus on awe and transcendence in art and music as uh, potential vehicles for for. For understanding. I have a slightly different view um, from both sides, and that is, you know, if I were to have a personal experience, um, I'm not sure I would trust that. Why would I trust that? Uh, so uh, it could be self delusion or wish fulfillment or any number of things. Cycles. Right, yeah. right, right. And uh, so I would be very. Um, uh, and and people who tell me that they've had this personal experience, I, I don't doubt that. Yeah, I never I, do. Uh, yeah. You know, so it's not critical of others, but I'm saying if I had it myself, I I wouldn't um, uh, I wouldn't uh, I would I would trust it. The most famous, one of the most famous atheists, uh, Christopher Hitchens, who was a brilliant polemicist. Um, you know, he got cancer as he died, you know, fairly young, tragically. And he's, he, he warned, he said, if I change my view about God, you know, toward the end of my life, don't believe it. It's yeah, just, right. it's just my cancer kind of right. inhabiting my brain. So if I have a deathbed confession, please don't believe it because it's really not me. <laughs> That's really good. Well, last class, we were preparing for your visit, and I raised the question of art, and then uh, let me just throw this out, and then we'll go to death for a minute or two. Um, and what I asked was, uh, since we learned in high school, many of us, uh, Robert Frost poems stopping by the woods on a snowy evening, could a computer understand the difference aesthetically ever, in, you know, infinite computer, uh, of me saying I was in a sled, it was horse drawn, it was dark one night and I stopped by the woods. I knew the guy that owned the place, I didn't think he would mind. And uh, then I decided, you know, to move on. I'm not gonna stop too long, I got a lot to do. Versus whose woods these are, I think I know his house is in the village though. He will not mind me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake and so forth. And of course it ends with that famous doublet. You know, I've got to go on because I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And if you've heard Frost read it, those last two lines and it's so far from just saying um you know i got a lot to do so i can't really stop that long in the woods and he was always asked is that about death and that can lead us to death so let me somebody wants the transcript on so okay is it on now yeah 
I don't see it. I don't know how the transcript works. So I said yes when I was asked. Closed captioning has been. You know, it's, oh, it's down at the bottom. Okay. So could you touch on that briefly and even because again, I would think that maybe the computer could get the joke and not laugh then or but these these kinds of emotional aesthetic things that we feel you and I've talked about classical music and you told me your story of of your friend who drew you into this music. I know you've come to love, love Leonard Cohen's uh, very powerful expressions of song and words. Uh, can these be reduced to zeros and O's, <laughs> zeros and ones, so to speak? Uh, isn't it something transcendent and it's the basis of religion and faith and everything really? You know, the, the ultimate answer is you, you, you absolutely don't know. Um, my answer is that you, you cannot. Um, uh, um, Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who is, uh, you know, arguably the, the, the leading person talking about the singularity in terms of when computers uh, uh, out, outshine human minds. He's now director of Google and great inventor. And, uh, you know, his, his, his view I, is that comp you will net, you will net, you cannot tell the difference ever between a computer and a human being. Ultimately, you can today, but very soon you cannot. He thinks within a few days, you know, he thinks very soon and not by the 2030s. So some people might think it might take, you know, 500 years. Um, so the question is not the time. <clears throat> the question is whether the reality and the reality is he's right that you will never be that at some point, maybe soon, maybe later, but surely there will be that you cannot ever tell a difference between a computer and a, a, a human being on any issue whatsoever, art, music, sense at all. But what you can never know is whether there's an internal experience within that computer, just like you can never know, is there an internal experience in any one of us here? I mean, you're, you have it for yourself, but you can yeah. never be 100% sure that someone else is having it. You see all the same characteristics that you have. So you infer that there is internal experience. So Kurzweil would say the same about a computer, just like we infer but there are other minds in each one of the people I see here. I infer that, I feel 100% sure that's true. He said, you will have that same experience with a, a, a computer. Uh, and my ultimate answer is that that is true if physicalism and materialism is true, if all there is to the, phys to the to, to reality is the physical world, then there's absolutely no reason whatsoever to present to prevent a um, a computer or any yeah. sort of non biological right. activity from exhibiting the same internal feeling. So that to me is the crucial question. If you are a physicalist, you have to conclude that a computer would have the same internal feeling. Uh, I happen to believe that's not the case, that there is something beyond the physical of something that uh, yeah. has to account for consciousness. But um, am I 100% sure of that? No. So if I unplug, I'm, I, I'm on my iMac right now, and it's got a lot of material stored on it, gigabytes, not that much compared to knowledge. But if I unplug it, or the electricity goes off, or let's just say, I unplug it and knock it off the table. It's damaged. Um, there's there's no metaphysical entity that preserves that computer, or what was stored on the hard drive or anything. It's just shut down. And isn't that what appears to happen with death? You know, you shut it shuts down. Everything shuts down, begins to deteriorate. And so, unless you had a rebooting. We talked about resurrection and immortality a lot in this class because we did Paul, we did Jesus, we did Buddhism, you know, with its different view of the soul. So is resurrection of the dead more scientifically plausible in that it would say, no, the computer shuts down, but if I could preserve what was in it, 
and reboot it into a quote new body, a new expression of that, then it could be up and running again. Well, that's certainly true at the computer. That's why we backed them up. You know, if I wrote a beautiful poem, greater than Robert Frost's poem, but I didn't remember it, but it's in my computer, it could presumably live again that poem, otherwise it's gone. Think of all the things that are lost throughout history. We have no idea what people thought that might have been wonderful. Books that were never written. <laughs> so is re my students asked me, is resurrection of the dead in its primitive form? Not so much today, people say, oh, your soul goes to heaven when you die, and they kind of go dualist. But the old idea of resurrection, dust you are to dust you will return, you know? But you could sleep in the dust and come forth. Is that, does anybody think about that scientifically that you talk to? Um, I think some of your Christian theologians do maybe. Yes, uh, uh, John Polkinghorne, uh, whose interviews I strongly recommend, was a leading quantum physicist at, uh, at, at uh, Cambridge, uh, taught quantum physics, um, and then decided to become an Anglican priest. And he went through a theology school. He spent a couple of years in, 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 uh, in, as, as a typical uh, pastor, as uh, helping people, and then returned as a professor of science and religion at Cambridge and became the leading uh, science and religion thinker. And his view uh, is exactly what you said, that uh, the resurrection is plausible uh, because uh, of this information content that uh, but still it's not a physical process it's a uh, i mean he he has god yeah, god would have to do it i mean it's yeah, not going to happen yeah. yeah but it it it, 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 it there, there he presented a a plausible case for the for the information to be preserved preserved it would be analogous to a computer but it would not be the same kind of you know zeros and ones or something it would be some sort of an imprint uh, that can be uh, saved, uh, that, that God would have, that would be used to resurrect. Um, yeah. And so his, his view is very similar to that information view as, as an analogy. Right. Okay, we're going to go a, a minute or two more. Anyone have a question? Just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. We got time for a couple questions. Anybody? We're recording this, so I'll post it where you, you have it. Don't be shy. Is there something any of you want to ask? <laughs> you just want to hear about the final exam? <laughs> it won't take me long to tell that. So anybody want to ask anything? Just okay. Abdullah, go ahead. Abdullah. Yes, hi, sir. How are you, John? I uh, just want to uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. Cohn for coming today. It was a pleasure to hear a scientist in front of me talking about life and everything else. Thank you for having me in your class, sir. It was a pleasure to be in your class and in your career. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. And good luck in your life. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Dula, thank you. This is, uh, I have a class this afternoon, but this is sort of like my last class. Uh, and uh, you guys are just wonderful. Uh, uh, I'm not retiring, you know that. Keep up with me, please, because I'd say I'm launching myself, actually. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't know this about Robert Kuhn, but not only did he have the PhD in, you know, brain science and so forth, but he's also been a businessman, an entrepreneur. He's very involved in uh, the history of China and, uh, you know, just the current political situation and so forth, uh, kind of helping to translate that. You'll see him on CNN a lot and television shows. So I also have uh, miles to go before I sleep, I hope. And that is, I won't be teaching formally full time. I think 45 years is enough. And students have asked me, will you miss it? Absolutely, I'll miss you all. But, uh, I want to also pursue in a very free and open way, just a dozen or so projects, filming, uh, some productions, some books, some projects with uh, Dr. Kuhn that we have in mind. 
So the retirement is actually launching into uh, other things that I would like to do uh, in the time that I have left at least. So I hope you'll keep up with me and I hope this class has meant something to you. Remember I told you the first day of class, my goal in this class is 20, 30 years from now, maybe I won't be here or maybe I will if I live to be you know, 106, like my wife's grandmother's 101. I think Robert's uh, mother lived to be 100 or so, right? Or close to it. Yeah. So it can happen. But anyway, I want you to say, when somebody says, oh, where'd you go? And you go, UNC Charlotte. This is just me, sorry. This is what I want you to do, Anna. Uh, where'd you go, UNC Charlotte? Oh, so what'd you major in? You tell, oh, I majored in this or that. And then you say, uh, what do you remember from your college days? I remember this one class, I think it was religious studies. It was Dr. Tabor, that was it, James Tabor. He's, I'm sure he's gone by now, but it was an amazing class. It really made me think. It really, I'll never forget it. That's my goal. If I did that, I'm successful. <laughs> well, I hope, you I hope I have you with all of you. So do your student evaluations. I'm trying to get 100%. Nobody's ever got 100% ever in our school. We do them electronically. Robert, it's usually uh, 33 is considered good. We're up to this morning uh, 51, but I want 100. And the reason I want 100 is I want my chair to say, Doc, you know, she calls me James. James. 100% of your students did the evaluations. Nobody's ever gotten that. What did you do? I said, I just asked them to do it. That's, <laughs> this is what I want to say when I do my exit interview. <laughs> Please, guys, help me. <laughs> I'm just asking. I just asked you. <laughs> we'll see if it works. So thank you, Robert. Uh, I, I need a little time to tell them about their final. Sure. It's wonderful to be with you. And all of you, yeah. please explore Closer to Truth. That's one of those deep, thick resources that you, you can use it in your college career, you can use it in graduate school, you use it in your personal life. Um, how do they find that index? I showed them one day, you go to the website closer to truth, because you've broken it down and amazing. Right, there's a, it's called a, to a topic guide. Yeah, topic guide. That's what you want to go to. And then you yeah, can yeah. dig down and pick what you're working on. Right. And actually, we're now working on a new, completely new website in which the topic guide will be featured in, in a much more um, good uh, intuitive way. So that'll be launched uh, before the end of the year. So it'll be a totally new Closer to Truth website. We're spending a lot of effort and resources on doing it because we have such enormous material uh, that it, dem it demands that. So it's a big focus. It's huge. It's on, and your YouTube thing is just huge. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, my really little good. YouTube channel gets a few views, but uh, yours is amazing. So thank well, you we're, for coming. We're really pleased that the, uh, the uh, expansion beyond the U.S. began 100% U.S. and now it's 60% outside the U.S. And what's amazing is it's 190 countries and there's no difference between religions, race, gender, or economic it's really level. really a phenomenal. Level. It really and is. So yeah. It's good to see so many different people uniting together yeah. in today's uh, fractious world where we have so many problems. But the kind of question that James is asking in these class that we ask on Closer to the Truth is, is the one thing that truly unites all human beings. Yeah, why are we here? Yeah. Well, thank you, Robert. We'll let thank you go. Everybody. James, we'll keep in close touch. All, all the best to everyone. Thank you.